So, so greetings. So um, my name is Shelley Maestron. I'm on the board of the Reston Historic Trust, and we're delighted to have you here tonight. We have some really interesting uh, material to present to you this evening. We Americans have been building utopias ever since the Europeans landed on, on the shores. And our utopias have come in all shapes and sizes, but many of them sort of were riffs or derivatives of the uh, English garden city movement of the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, Ebenezer Howard and those that followed after him. Um, some early models in the United States were Sunnyside Gardens in Queens and Radburn in New Jersey, right across the Hudson River from New York. Um, tonight, we're gonna hear from some models that evolved basically from those early models um, with a, a lot of similarities. Um, a lot of them, uh, Greenbelt and Columbia that we're gonna hear from tonight um, have similar design characteristics. And I could go on and on and on and tell you all about them, but I'm not going to, because we have two wonderful speakers tonight to fill you in on that. Um, Megan Searing Young is the director of the Greenbelt Museum. She's been there since 2008. Um, she oversees day-to-day -day operations of the Greenbelt Museum. She also gives lectures and presentations and has written about Greenbelt in a book called Images of America colon, Greenbelt. She has a BA in art history and women's studies from Johns Hopkins University and an MA in the, the history of decorative arts from Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Institution and Parsons School of Design program. It's a mouthful, but so very qualified. <laughs> um, Erin Berry is the archivist for the uh, Columbia, Maryland archives. Um, she started as an archivist assistant assistant there in 2018, but she is now the, the chief archivist. Um, she has a bachelor, bachelor's degree in history and cultural anthropology from Mill Millersville University in Pennsylvania and a master's in library and information science from the University of Maryland. So we now would love to hear from Megan. You're on first. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for coming out tonight, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. And a special thank you to Shelley Mastron and Alex Campbell for, yeah. is it on? It is not or is? <laughs> Here we go, try it now. Testing. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a very loud voice, so. <laughs> So let me just repeat that. Thanks so much to everyone for coming out tonight and a special thank you to Shelley and to Alex for inviting me here. And I'm also so glad to hear about Columbia, Maryland. Um, so before I got started, um, I would just like to, um, you know, say as we all become more and more aware of diminishing natural resources, I think it's uh, the importance of efficient land use and planning um, how that land is gonna be used is more relevant than ever. Um, you know, tonight will be very interesting, as Shelley mentioned, to trace these threads from garden cities of the UK through Radburn to Greenbelt, Reston, and Columbia. And um, I'll just go ahead and get started here. Um, and we're looking forward to questions at the end. So please do let us know if you have questions at the end of all our presentations. So Greenbelt was really built for three reasons. Um, it was built by the federal government in 1937 as part of the New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Just find my arrow keys, sorry. It was a relief project. That was one of the reasons it was built. It put people to work who were really struggling to find work, obviously in the Great Depression. Um, and you can see from the poster there that um, the Labor the Development Administration was intent on making sure that everyone understood that these were relief projects. Um, they advertised how many laborers they had at the sites um, and how uh, the various jobs skills that were being created. And um, you can see on the other side there, there's a shot of Greenbelt being constructed. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, sorry. It looks like it's oh, not, no, it's not going. slides here. Hold on. Let's see. That was moving well enough. Yeah. It did on my side. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. 
Test for the room, we are in the world. Hold on. <laughs> cheating, <laughs> cheating. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's always the same, isn't it? Okay. Should I go to the um Oh, oh, there we go. Is. There we go. Oh, thank you. Wait, which one? It's just the arrows at the bottom, is it right? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. That's much better. Okay. <laughs> so just to um, recap, um, Rebelt was built in 1937 as part of the New Deal. It was built under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and it was really built primarily for three reasons. One was it was a relief project, so it put people to work who desperately needed jobs. Um, another was that it relieved a housing shortage. Washington, D.C. was one of the areas that you, there were still jobs to be had, so many people were flocking to the area, but there was a, a real shortage of adequate homes, particularly for families of low to moderate income. So you can see some of the advertising that the resettled administration did um, was not very subtle. Um, Greenbelt or gutter, <laughs> which were your child. So um, they really were promoting this idea of the garden cities um, as being of the garden, the Greenbelt Towns program, which were garden cities, as being um, helpful places to raise families. And the third reason, which is the primary one that I'll talk about mostly tonight, was that it was a model of modern town planning. Um, the, um, color image there is the cover of a booklet called Greenbelt Towns. And this really was sort of the resettlement administration's manifesto, if you will, um, for how these towns would function. It justified why they were going to be built. And a page from the inside um, of the booklet there shows the sort of chaotic uh, city um, and then the more um, calm green space off to the um, upper right, that is the Greenbelt Town. So this is um, one of the things they were interested in promoting is kind of educating their audience about what these towns were. Uh, the planners were also very upfront, very direct, and they thought that if the suburbs were not planned in this careful way, that the result would be suburban sprawl. And um, we all know how that turned out. So <laughs> they were pressing it in that way. Uh, there were three green towns built. Um, one was in Green Hills, Ohio. One was Greendale, um, Wisconsin, and the other was supposed to be, there was a fourth one that was supposed to be built in New Jersey that was held up in litigation, and it was never built. Um, you can make it out, but on the, the one from um, about Greendale, Wisconsin, you can see they actually used the word cul-de-sac there. So you can see some of these um, mainstays that would come up in post-war development um, were started even back in the 30s, this community. The Green Towns program was really the brainchild um, of Rexford Guy Tugwell. He was appointed by Roosevelt to lead the resettlement administration. And he was an economist from Columbia. Um, he was the one that really convinced FDR to take a chance and build these communities. Um, as you can see from the newspaper clipping there, um, he was uh, um, a controversial figure, I'll say. <laughs> Many people didn't think the government should be in the business of building private homes. And um, he was um, often called Rex the Red, or the communities were called Tugwell Town or Tugwell's Folly. Um, they were very, very critical of what he was trying to do. He wasn't the best at um, putting things in layman's terms. Um, and he tended to be um, fairly intellectual. You can see he's there at the job site in his white suit, he was famous for wearing those, so not the most practical, um, but uh, you know, he was very dedicated to the idea of these communities and really was intent on 
them being not just places for families to live healthfully, but also places that could be populated with cooperative businesses. He saw that as the middle way. So sort of um, in the space between socialism and capitalism, he thought that cooperatives would be the answer to that. Um, you all are familiar with cooperatives, but the definition we use at Greenbelt is a business that's owned and operated by the people who use or benefit from its, its services. So it really is a quite a different kind of approach um, to business. And there are still, I think seven to eight cooperatives still functioning in Greenbelt today. Tugwell of course took many of his ideas um, from the garden cities, as Shelley mentioned earlier, um, Ebenezer Howard was the philosopher who envisioned these communities on the outskirts of major cities. Um, he was responding to some of the overcrowded and unhealthful environments um, that had developed in cities, partly as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so he proposed these be built in the UK. Um, his book, Garden Cities of Tomorrow, would go on to be extremely influential in terms of planning. Um, his ideas were translated into a community in New Jersey, Radburn, New Jersey. Um, Clarence Stein and Henry Wright were responsible for that. And you can see um, in the image on the color image there, these sort of little groupings of houses and the main road there is in the center, but not actually um, flowing in and around the houses. So this whole idea was something that was developed in Radburn that we'll see again in Greenbelt and I'm sure in um, here and in Columbia as well. Um, some of the other features were the idea of super blocks. So they would take a, um, wait, let me go back here. They would take a regular city block and sort of blow it up into a larger block that had the effect of pushing the roads to the outskirts. And then the sidewalks that normally would line city blocks were transferred into um, a system of walkways and pathways that would wind throughout the community. And I have some pictures of that coming up. Um, another influence was European housing that was being built for workers. Um, following the destruction of World War I, many areas in Europe needed to rebuild and they needed to build adequate housing for people also of low to moderate income. So you can see that's another page uh, from the Resettlement Administration booklet. Um, and the little houses there show the number of homes being built with state aid. So you can see the tiniest little house is what's happening in the USA. So you know, keep in mind, this is long before there was a public housing department or really any kind of, um, any kind of more robust response to public housing. On the other side, there's a photograph of completed Greenbelt housing. And you can see with the flat roofs and the sort of um, modernist feeling of that, you can see some of that European influence. Some people would call it a Bauhaus inspired or modernist or international style. Greenbelters themselves called it functionalist, which are kind of like, they were like no fancy finishes, just very sort of straight functional homes. They built two kinds of houses. One were the flat roof tines that I just sh showed. And then this was a peaked roof home um, with slate roof made out of a brick veneer. So this looks more like what domestic architecture in the US would have looked like at the time, rather than the flat roofed houses. We're not entirely sure why they built both kinds. Um, some historians think that because they were teaching their workers new skills, the flat roofed houses were built with cinder blocks, which is a relatively new building material. Um, other people think that maybe um, it was a compromise because the, the flat roofed homes just looked too modernist, too sort of unlike what was being built here in the US. So they compromised by building some with peaked roofs. Here's an image showing what I was talking about with the super block, um, groupings of houses that were called courts, an interior park, and the homes were flipped at the same as they were in Radburn. So there's actually a service side and a garden side. And you can see how they took a regular city block. Um, the color image there is a map of Greenbelt that's included in that booklet. Um, they took a regular city block and sort of made it more of an organic shape, pushed the roads to the outskirts, replaced it with the pathways, and that kept everyone safe and kept the vehicle traffic away from pedestrian traffic. Here's an aerial view where you can also see those blocks and the courts, the groups of housing. There were groups of two, four, six, and eight houses altogether. Um, some of this idea came from a sociologist named Clarence Perry, who talked about the neighborhood unit. And that was groupings of houses along with um, an area for stores and schools and um, uh, playgrounds and areas like that to make up each of these sort of neighborhood blocks. This image shows the garden side where the woman's watering her yard. Um, and then the other side is the service side. 
So the garden side faced the interior walkways and the um, green space, shared green space, where the service side was where anything necessary to have the household function, like milk was delivered there, trash pickup was there. In fact, there's a little trash closet where your uh, trash cans were stored. So if you think about overcrowding in the cities, um, with laundry hanging everywhere in the streets and children playing in the gutter and trash cans everywhere. Greenbelt was the antidote to that. This was the sort of response to that. Everything had a place, everything was ordered. The flip side of that is there were a lot of rules. So for instance, laundry had to be taken in every day by 4 p.m. and no laundry at all could be hung on Sundays. So um, the early residents from oral histories, we can tell they didn't really mind this so much. They were so happy to be living there um, that they thought that it was worth it. Uh, however, it was a source of um, some anxiety <laughs> because they had to get their laundry in at a certain time. And we think that's partly to keep the community looking a certain way, but also because there were dignitaries and ambassadors and even tourists coming out to see Greenbelt. And the planners had a lot invested in making sure that this succeeded the way they wanted it to and having it look a certain way. So by the time Greenbelt was done being finished, um, it included these carefully designed homes, ample green space, a school and community center, a lake and a pool, a shopping area with a cinema, ball fields, tennis courts, playgrounds, cooperative businesses, and there was a fair amount of public art. Um, the furniture that you see there in that room actually was designed by the federal government. So you could add it to your month's rent if you wanted to. You didn't have to, but you could. And it was designed by a division within the resettlement administration called Special Skills. They were woodworkers and crafters and sculptors and weavers. And um, the, they designed the furniture and it was bid out by different companies. Um, and people moving into Greenbelt could buy, as I said, a piece of it or a whole house full. The kitchens were also state of the art and came with a small refrigerator, an electric stove, built in sink and built in cabinetry. Every room in the house had overhead lighting. There were no dark corners. There were no sort of stuffy spaces. Um, and it became um, the people that moved in talk about it being really transformative when they did arrive. So here's some of those um, images that show the, the interior system, the pathways and the underpass that is like what was at Radburn um, a pathway today. And also um, these interior spaces were great for playgrounds. So there were 13 small playgrounds built throughout Greenbelt and three large scale ones. Some historians think it really was designed uh, with children in mind. The Greenbelt Center there has a large scale sculpture that was by a New Deal artist named Lenore Thomas Strauss. And um, the school was not just a school, but also, in fact, in the records, in the, in, the, um, in the plans, you can see that it's called the Greenbelt School. It's called Center School and Community Building. The planners always um, envisioned that that would be the place for adults to have classes and, and meetings at night. There were no churches in the community, um, so they needed spaces where people could meet. And then there was a pool also. The cooperative store um, is still in Greenbelt, still operating. It's gone through a couple different incarnations, but um, it is still there. And um, you can become a member. Um, you don't have to be a member to shop there, but you can. And you'll get a rebate back at the end of the year if there's a profit made. One of the real tragedies of Greenbelt is that only white families could um, apply to live in the community. It was built by a workforce that was both white workers and African-American workers. Um, but because of the deep segregation in Prince George's County, black families could not apply to live in Greenbelt. Um, there was a box that you had to check for race on the application form. The early plans for Greenbelt did include um, a section of the land that was purchased that was going to be for African-American families to use that was going to be called the Rossville Rural Development. Um, that didn't happen. It was too controversial and it was jettisoned very early on. Um, in some accounts, the planners refer to two other communities in the Mid-Atlantic region that were built for Black families. One is Langston Terrace Dwellings in DC, and the other is Aberdeen Gardens in Newport News, Virginia. Um, the folks at Aberdeen Gardens have just completed, a, um, I think, a, a long-form documentary. So keep a lookout for that. It's a fascinating place. Both of those places were designed by prominent African-American architect Hilliard Robinson. And Aberdeen Gardens, actually, everyone involved in the project, from the laborers to the planners to the administrators, they were all um, African-Americans. So to get into Greenbelt, um, it was really quite an intense process. Um, the the uh, selection committee would come to your home, they would do an interview with you and potentially with your uh, husband, and they wanted to see what kind of housekeeper the wife was. Um, they were looking for families who were educated, or the parents had some education and who would be willing to really live in this sort of new experimental way and to roll up their sleeves and form all the committees and clubs and all the things that you need to have a, a functioning community. 
Um, it was integrated in terms of religion. So there were 63% Protestant, 30% Catholic and 7% Jewish. That's what they were aiming for. Um, and we think they pretty much hit that mark. There were over 5,000 applicants for the 888 homes. Um, so it was really um, quite a feat to even get into the community. And the average age of the residents was about 28. So it's a very young group. Um, the birth rate was actually triple the national average once everyone got there. So there were lots of jokes about that, about there being something in the water or, um, but, you know, looking back on it, I think it's largely because the families or young families felt comfortable to either begin having children or to add to their family numbers. Um, so they really were looking for these sort of idealized young families, often with young children, where the mother would be at home with the children, the father would be working outside of the home. Sometimes you'll hear that was a law in Greenbelt. It wasn't really a law, but um, it was one of the things that was sort of an expectation. But a lot of the women had their own separate economy. You know, they were doing hair in their living rooms. They took gave piano lessons. They took in sewing. They took in laundry. So they were working, um, just not necessarily outside of the home in addition to all their household duties. In 1941-42, um, there was a dire need for housing for wartime workers. So the government took some of the land that was there at Greenbelt and put up um, World War II housing. It was hastily built and was not nearly as fully realized as the rest of Greenbelt. You can see that red circle there is where it was added on. And the close up there shows how it lacked um, the system of inner walkways and pathways. So exactly what Greenbelt was trying to avoid happened here, which was children playing in those parking lot areas. Early on, a little girl was actually struck by a truck. Um, and this, this section of town was one of the ones that um, Clarence Stein wrote a book um, that just really lambasted this section of Greenbelt. He said it was kind of an abomination, <laughs> didn't understand why they hadn't been able to do it, the, the plan, the way it was supposed to be, but um, it was because they were building too quickly. In 1952, the government actually sold the communities. In Greenbelt, it went into um, single ownership, into a cooperative. This is a photograph of everyone signing the papers to take it on. Um, originally, it was veterans housing, but then they opened it up to everyone. Um, the challenge was they had to market it to people who'd been living with relatively little low rents, basically paying the government their rent, um, and they had to get them, convince them to purchase some of these homes. So many people didn't want to do that and left, but um, over time, it, the cooperative has grown and it has become a very well established. So it still owns most of the original homes today. Greenbelt continued to be segregated all the way up into the 60s. Um, there was a Fair Housing Committee active in 1963, but that group um, was really sort of an odd mix of people who were progressive and wanted to live in a community um, that was not segregated alongside people who were just worried that their housing price was gonna go down if black families moved in. So it was um, a complicated kind of group and time in Greenbelt, um, but they, the, the people that were the most dedicated really did fight to integrate. And we were able to track down um, the one of the first families that moved into Greenbelt. And there's an interview with, her name is Angie, um, Angie Williams. And uh, she gave us an interview about moving into Greenbelt at this time period. And it's really fascinating. Um, they um, moved in in uh, 67. So that's, they were one of the first families to move into the center of town. Greenbelt's continued to grow over the years. There's been lots of infill developments. These are um, advertising Charlestown Village and Lakeside North, two big communities that were built in the 60s. You can see both are trying to emphasize this sort of, you call it country life or the, the combination of town and country, which was what um, the original Greenbelt plan was trying to do. And now um, the, here is a photo of the co-op. The co-op still owns all the original housing. And they're very upfront about it. They say co-op living is not necessarily for everyone. <laughs> The community is owned collectively and each um, you, you don't own the bricks and mortar of your home, you earn the perpetual right to live in your home. So all of the decisions that are made are made collectively and um, there's a lot of meetings <laughs> so, and a lot of citizen involvement. Um, these are just some slides of images of what we do at the museum. Um, the museum was founded in 1987 when the community was 50 years old. Um, we're now 35 years old and we do have one of the original homes that we do tours. Um, we give walking tours. We have kids programs. We do lectures. We have exhibits. We do talks like this. Um, we have a website, lots of information on it and um, that plus more. So um, we're excited because we're coming up on um, 
uh, raising money for the home that's next door to the museum house that's going to be a visitor center. Uh, it is um, right now, it has been a residence. It was residence for, I think, 60 years. And so we're trying to transform it into everything we need it to be for a visitor center. Um, so we invite you to all come and visit us and have a look. Um, we used to be open every Sunday. We had to scale that back post pandemic, uh, but you can get tickets on Eventbrite if you just search for us. So thank you very much. Sort of a whirlwind tour, but. <laughs> Whole questions till the end, and we'll just do some magic. Hopefully, this is not as difficult this time around. Okay, there we go. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. No? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Hello. Um, just again, my name is Erin Berry. Um, so I am the archivist as well as the manager of the Columbia, Maryland Archives. Um, okay. So um, this is my short spiel that I give for every presentation. So. Um, the Columbia, Maryland Archives is the primary resource on the history and planning um, of Columbia, as well as its visionary founder, James Rouse. Um, so we are also a community archive. So we preserve, and organize, and provide access to information about the community of Columbia. So saying that, um, I am not a historian. I am an archivist. I only say that because uh, my job is to provide information. Um, I do not interpret history. So uh, when I do these, I just want you to not take this as the word of law. Um, I want you to explore and to think about this yourself. Um, so that's why I get that little spiel. So whenever you're talking about Columbia, you have to talk about James Rouse. He was the founder of Columbia. Um, so James Rouse was born in April um, 26 of 1914, which is actually the same year that Robert Simmons, uh, uh, the developer of Reston, was also born, uh, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> um, so he was the youngest of four siblings, and he grew up in Easton, Maryland. Um, and I mention this because Easton was a very important part of uh, Rouse's, um, how he grew up and the man that he became. It showed him what a community, what a small community, what that brought to people. Um, another, um, for me, my personal taking of James Rouse's life, um, a, a very important event that I, that I think is, wow, okay. He, um, so he was actually orphaned when he was 16, um, him and his siblings. And uh, when, so his siblings, he was very lucky, his older siblings took care of him essentially. Um, and it was also around the Great Depression. So he, one of his older siblings was uh, married and her husband was stationed in Hawaii. Um, so he actually went to the University of Hawaii for about a year. Um, and there he actually experienced diversity. Eastern Maryland is not diverse and it was not diverse then. Um, so he actually learned empathy, I think, from going to this campus. And I think that that was really important as he grew up and became a developer. Um, so he actually started developing shopping centers. That's how he got into it. He was actually a mortgage broker before that. Um, and the first uh, shopping center was actually in 1949 in Baltimore called um, Mondavin Shopping Center, which is still around. Um, and then from there, he started developing into um, residential areas. So going back to Columbia. So Columbia's in Howard County, Maryland. Um, and um, in the beginning, um, around 1963 is when it started, 
all of a sudden someone started buying up all of this land. There was all these LLCs just buying land. No one knew who owned these LLCs. No one knew why they were buying this land. But within a nine month period, there were 140 separate land purchases of about 14,000 acres. Um, and then in October of 1963, that's when the Rouse Company, James Rouse and his team, stated that it was him that was buying all of this land and they were going to make a city. And the reason that it was so secretive was because he had to keep the prices low. He, you know, he only had so much money and he was a businessman. This was a business decision. So he had to make sure that the sales could be done. Um, and also back then there wasn't the internet. You couldn't just look up who owned these LLCs. So no one knew that it was James Rouse, not even the man who was helping him um, purchase this land, um, the realtor. Um, and also the reason that they decided to do Howard County was because of the location. It's in between Baltimore and Washington. Um, James Rouse and his team saw that there would be the dreaded urban sprawl into this area. So they thought that it would be the best location to develop a city, a new town um, with the garden city um, concepts. But one thing that I personally really appreciate about James Rouse is that he knew that he didn't understand everything. Um, and I think that that was one of his strengths. He was good at hiring people who knew things that he didn't and he didn't have to, and he was willing to just let them do their thing. So when they purchased the land, they announced it, they were like, wow, we don't know what people need. We're making the city for people. What do they actually need? So they decided to do. Um, so they de decided to form what they called the work group. Um, this was also in 1963, um, and this was a six-month period of interdisciplinary meetings um, with different experts in the areas of education, recreation, sociology, transportation, religion, and then as well as architects and um, engineers. Um, and they just weighed in on their areas of expertise made um, various reports and were like, this is what we think would be best for a city within these areas and this is what you should provide. Um, because James Rouse, the thing that he really preached was that a city should be for the people. It should be for their amenities and their things. Um, he was very much within his field of urban design. He was constantly doing, like this man didn't sleep. Like there are books <laughs> about his life and they're like, yes, he had insomnia. He did not sleep, he worked. <laughs> so he would do so many things within urban design and always he was saying, we need to look into what people actually need. If you're designing these places, you need to do it for the people, not just because it looks pretty. Um, so this is a photo of the work group, um, which was in November, uh, this photo, um, I believe this was one of the first ones in 1964. Um, but the one thing I will say that was a negative of this group was that they're planning for all of these different types of people. James Rouse wanted this to be an integrated society, a community. He wanted all different religions and people. There's a bunch of white men and one white woman. And the woman was talking about family life. So I will say that that was one negative. If you want all of these people to have their needs and all of those people should be at the table. But again, that is my interpretation. So after this work group, they came up with these four guiding principles um, that, um, so I keep saying James Rouse and his team and it is very confusing, but so there is the Rouse company, right? And that was James Rouse's company. And that was mainly like the mortgage broker side, right? So then there was an arm of the Rouse company, which was a Howard Research and Development. And that was the development arm of the Rouse company that developed Columbia. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So these were the four principles that they were following, which is to make a complete city, respect the land, um, 
provide, oh, sorry, provide uh, for the growth of people as well as to make a profit. Um, and they just kept following those. And those four principles are still talked about and uh, mentioned within Howard Hughes, which is the developer of Columbia now, as well as uh, Columbia Association, which is the um, like homeowners association of Columbia. So they bought all this land, they talked in a group, they have their principles. Now what are they gonna do? Now they have to get those zoning rights um, as well as design it. So um, November 11th of 1964, James Rouse had a comprehensive booklet of 51 pages um, that he presented to Howard County Council, uh, or sorry, the commission um, that really lined out the goals and general ideas of the city design. He introduced the villages and neighborhood concepts, plans for business and industry, recreation and open space, as well as the town center. Um, this is a page from um, the booklet. Um, you can find this booklet as well, the whole scanning on um, our website, uh, the Columbia Archives website. Um, if you would like to peruse, but really, I mean, it states it right in the beginning, Columbia, a cluster of small towns. That was really the essence. Um, so the real like, oh, whoops, whoops, why isn't it going up? Okay, there was gonna be another photo, I'm so sorry. I don't see it. Anyway, I'm so sorry. So anyway, there was um, a model of uh, that they showed that was like the physical part of this presentation. Um, and it was literally like a huge table. And it was just a model of the city. And really, he showcased uh, the town center. That's what he was really showing to these commissioners to be like, this is what it's going to look like. This is what we're planning. Please give us the zoning rights. Um, and he did get the new town zoning in June of 1965. Um, and then the construction started um, in June of 1966. And the birthday of Columbia is in June of 1967, which was during the dedication of the first village, which was Wild Lake. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. There, I had some other... Um, uh, diagrams to showcase what the village and the neighborhood concept, but just think of like big circles. Um, and that's really what it was. It was just like these, I know that Rustin uses the jargon of clusters. Um, so it kind of was like that, clusters. So villages with, and they had neighborhoods in it. Each neighborhood has a village center. Um, and I know I was looking at some advertisements of Rustin in the beginning, and I thought it was really interesting that they used Village Center as like the physical, literal, like center of the village. In Colombia, we use Village Center as um, a shopping center, essentially. Um, it's someplace that you go with like grocery stores and things. And it seems that Rustin sort of started using that jargon later to refer to their Village Center. So I just thought that was really interesting. Pardon? Oh, yes. Um, okay, so Columbia today. So it's an unincorporated um, community, so it's not a incorporated um, city. The population um, from the 2020 census is 104,000 people. There are 10 villages, um, and, the, um, and the 10th village is the town center. The first village was Wild Lake, which was incorporated in 1967. Um, and the last village was River Hill in 1990. There are nine village centers, uh, 15 neighborhood centers. There are 23 outdoor um, and five indoor pools. We do love our pools. There is an ice rink, um, a sports park, a skateboard park, three athletic clubs, three man-made lakes, there are eight high schools that serve at least some part of Columbia, and there are 94 miles of pathways. Um, but I just really wanted to showcase these photos. These are all photos from our wonderful volunteer, Ron Fedorzak. 
Um, he has our largest collection of photographs. That man takes photographs of everything and I appreciate it. Um, but I really wanted to showcase what Columbia looked like today. These are all photos from 2019 to 2022. Um, and I just think that it's nice to see what the community uses this space for because that's really what matters is the community. So um, a little bit about Reston and Columbia. I, so I knew that Reston was a planned community, obviously, but again, I'm not a historian, I'm an archivist. So I know mostly about Columbia because that's the material that I work with. Um, and I really wanted to see how much James Rouse and Robert Simmons talked to each other. Um, and also just like general understanding. So yes, Reston was first. Um, they started in 1964. And then two years later, it was Columbia in 1966. So it was very close together. Um, and like I said, 1964 was a magical year. That's when uh, um, James Rouse started buying the land. It was showcasing the land and getting his zoning rights. Um, some similarities of Reston and, uh, and Columbia that just what I have noticed um, are these towns and village concepts um, that the village centers are the areas of retail. Um, these concepts of respecting the land, having housing for all, and also the concept of having an integrated city. I thought that was wonderful that that was part of the planning of Reston as well, um, especially in some place like Virginia during that time. Um, it was very hard even in Maryland during that time. Howard County was very segregated and not, not happy about that. Um, the amenities and leisure concept, having, you know, being able to work and play in the same area, having golf courses and pools and arts, um, as well as man-made lakes, which I just thought was a fun fact that both places have it. Um, but really the difference um, that I really saw was just really the terms that they used in order to sell both places, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And again, that's just what I noticed. Um, so I was also looking to see, so one of our largest collections um, at the archives is actually James Rouse's papers. Um, so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to dig through and see what he had about Reston. Um, and again, like I said, James Rouse and uh, Robert Simmons talked to each other. So this is correspondence from 1961. And this is a letter from James Rouse to Robert Simmons. And he said, hey, I would love to help you with Reston. Um, you know, we got Rouse Company, we're a mortgage broker, we could maybe help you out with some money, we could figure this out together. Uh, why don't we? Um, so that never came to fruition. Um, but they did talk to each other and they were both still friendly with each other, even though that, that didn't work out because um, in 1963-64, Robert Simmons found out that James Rouse was buying all this land for Columbia. So he was like, how could you help me when you got all that going on? And so that's why they ended up not doing that together in Reston. Um, so another thing, so since it was so closely developed together, they really sort of um, learned from each other, I think. I know, so I was looking at James Rouse's papers. So these are his papers that he collected. So I'm really looking from his point of view. Um, and he was trying to learn about the positives and the negatives that were happening in Reston as he was doing Columbia. So this first correspondence, <laughs> so this first correspondence was to James Rouse from his employee, uh, William Finley in 1964. And these were Finley's reactions to coming to Reston. Um, he says, um, their sales building is too jazzy, artwork too abstract, not comfortable for potential home and lot buyers. And I thought that that was really interesting because the, um, the sales building, you would say, in Columbia was called the exhibit building. They really use like a museum to promote and to sell Columbia. There was a whole video that was like basically like a commercial um, and like big panels that they would show because they had to show what Columbia would look like before it was built. And that's how they would sell people. And they had like realtors in this building and they'd be like, oh, come with us, see the, see the houses while you're here. So that's, 
So I thought that that was really interesting. That was the first thing he pointed out. His second was the place looks like it is out in the sticks, no activity, not really a place. Their development and PR is highbrow, resulting in only one African-American family visiting in six months period. Uh, Clow, who was, um, uh, he worked for Robert Simmons, um, has felt that they have so little to show that he is glad to respond. Uh, he is glad the response has been so minimal. So Clow, he left um, Simmons, so that's why he's kind of talking negatively. Um, so I just thought that that was really interesting as well because um, he, uh, my apologies, I lost what I was saying. Um, so James Ross really wanted to have multiple different types of housing as well as um, income-based housing for different types of families and all economics. So I think that that's also why Finley kind of pointed that out because that was something that was really important to them. So this second is correspondence um, to James Rouse from his brother, Willard Rouse, um, who was his older brother, his right-hand man. He worked for James. Like they were very tight um, and they seemed like they had a very good relationship. Um, so Willard was saying, I suggested that we learn, study, uh, listen, study, and learn from Reston's mistakes. You replied, James replied, how would you like to approach it? So they really were trying to learn. I, and I just think it's interesting, like back then, again, I'm looking at my perspective. Um, you know, th there wasn't the internet. <laughs> they were talking and sharing ideas and, and learning from each other. And they were in the same field. Of course, they talked to each other, but it was just through the mail. Yeah, it took a little bit of time, but of course they did. And it, they were, I mean, I just drove from Columbia to here. It's not like it's that hard. Of course, they visited each other, but I just never really thought about it until I started looking at it. Um, I think the, the most negative thing, though, that happened with, Jane, with Columbia and Reston was that people were comparing them right from the beginning. And I don't think that that was very helpful for either um, what James Rouse was doing or what Robert Simmons was doing. I just don't think it was. Um, so this was from a, um, this was correspondence to James Rouse from, again, William Finley. And he was talking about how this gentleman, um, Bob Ryan, was talking um, during a Reston Citizens meeting um, about, and he was very criticizing Rouse of the over planning for religion, health, et cetera. Um, and they basically, uh, I cut it out of this correspondence, but Finley was like, let's just invite him here. Let's just chat, let's invite his wife. We'll talk to him, it'll be okay. So I thought that that was fun. Oh, well, not really fun, but, um, you know, just this criticizing concept. Um, and again, um, this comparison. So this was created, this report by the Columbia Marketing Department. And this is also in the display over at the Reston Museum too, if you would like to look at it up close. Um, and this was written in 1975. Um, so again, they were really just comparing the physicals of uh, Reston and Columbia. And I think because, I mean, they were literally developed around the same time, of course, they are going to compare. But again, I think it was kind of a negative um, just because the Columbia is so much larger than Reston. Like you can see the acreage right at the top. Columbia is 14,000 acres. Reston is 700 or 7,400 during this time. Um, and, you know, of course, they're going to be different. They have different sizes. They had different things that they were trying to do. Yeah, they were similar, but I don't know. That's just, again, this is just my personal thought. Um, so there's about three pages of this. They did the education, recreational facilities. And again, this was in 1975. So this is not what it looks like today. Um, Uh, business and industry, and then the sources at the bottom. So um, I will just say that personally, again, um, 
I think that both of these communities have really flourished because, well, one, they're still around, and two, they're both beautiful places to live and learn. Um, and I think that both Robert Simmons and James Rouse did a very similar and very different, but very wonderful job. So again, um, thank you so much for having me here and for the museum for inviting me. Um, and I think we'll be ready for questions as well. Yeah, so this was a really, um, so is there something specific you would like to know about it? Or? You know, you have at least one very actually important building and it was the old Rouse Bedford. Yes. Yeah, so there were a couple places um, developed by uh, Frank Gehry. Yeah, so this is a really brief history of Columbia, truly. Um, and again, if anybody is very interested in a specific topic, please feel free to reach out there. My little um, pamphlets are in there with uh, my contact information. So yeah, Frank Gehry designed a couple things. So the, um, the Rouse headquarters, which is on the lakefront, um, is now a Whole Foods, but he designed that. He's a world renowned architect now. Yeah, I know it's a Whole Foods, which was like a really big, like in the community when it happened. Um, he also did um, the Meriwether Post Pavilion, which is our concert hall, which is a really nice concert hall, I will say. I really enjoy that, even before I knew anything about Columbia, um, as well as a fire station. And um, I can never remember its name. I'm so sorry. But yeah, it's a very random building. Um, is there any other things that you would like to know about the architecture? Or was it mainly Frank? Just that in particular. Yeah. It is an early work of his. Yes. All things considered, it's really quite nice. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so it was very much early in his, um, in his career. And I think they look very different from his work um, as he was going on. But it is... Um, very, um, just the amount of artists and builders and things that came to Columbia, I mean, just a vast amount, even with our um, homes, um, just so many builders would buy lots and make so many vast different types of single family homes, um, condos, townhouses, and we have a vast collection of that. Um, so if you're ever interested in looking at some fun advertisements for different houses, Please let me know. Yes. Yes. Is the Rouse Company still involved? Is they how did if not how did they transition it to whoever's? That's a great question. Now. So um so the way that they transitioned the land, the plan was always that the Rouse Company would take it. So they they got it. HRD, Howard Research and Development, developed it. Um, and then they transferred all the land to the Columbia Association. Columbia Association, so I'm going to describe it wrong, but here's why. It basically is like a local government, but it's not. It's a homeowners association um, and they um, look after all of the land. They provide all of uh, like a bunch of leisure activities, pools, gyms, different stuff like that. I actually work for Columbia Association. So there's a lot of community services, um, but they aren't a government. I just say that because that was kind of Rouse's thoughts. He wanted something that would provide for the people that wasn't the uh, county government. So once the land was done, that the developers were done with the land, they gave it to Columbia Association. Um, uh, the Rouse Company is no longer around. From what I understand, I could be wrong. So it's now Howard Hughes. So I'm always confused because there's so many, there's so many names. <laughs> but from what I understand, Howard Research and Development became Howard Hughes. They are still developing Columbia as well as Howard County. Um, but CA or Columbia Association maintains the land that they own that was originally bought by the Rouse Company. Did you follow that? Yeah, I so so just as an example, yes. the Columbia Association made the decision about I don't know who made. In in I I do not know, so I don't even want to to um to answer that because I I just don't know. Yeah, sorry, but I can always look that up for you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Anybody else? Yes. Yes. I know, I'm so sorry. One of those was the kind of town center kind of where people would gather and mm -hmm. prepare. Were the other circles, did they have centers? Yes. What were their centers like? So there are, so within the village, I wish I could pull it up for you. I'm so sorry. So within the, so, okay. So think of Columbia, it's kind of like a triangle. So there are circles within it. Those are the villages. Then there are circles within those circles. Those are the neighborhoods. And then there's a tiny circle that is the village center. And those village centers have shops, um, a lot of grocery stores in the beginning. Um, right now they're trying to make one of the village centers of Longbridge um, more of like an art facility. So they have like an art center. They have this place called the Doodle Nest. It's really cool. Um, a bunch of galleries. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the money wants to go there. And uh, we're kind of like a happy result. Right. So, do you have a similar situation there with the different circles? Or... So, I can't really speak of that again because I, I just don't know. Um, but there are vastly different. So, the neighborhood centers were made for the people that live within those specific villages. So, they were supposed to have their amenities and also be able to be walkable. That's why there's all those paths. Um, so the town center, I would picture more of like a main, like a main street, I would call it. Their, um, their restaurants are different than the neighborhood center restaurants. Um, do they compete with each other? Probably. A lot of the grocery stores have left. There's been a lot of turnover. Um, that's why they're trying to make the Long Reach Village Center more of like an art facility because it was failing very heavily. Um, sorry, um, pretty heavily. And so that's why they were trying to redesign it. But again, I don't take my word for law. It used to be a shopping center, mm -hmm. then the first mall, right? The very first mall in the city of and it was killed. Right. They tried to hang on to that shopping center idea instead of finding an alternative. Okay. This little big box space which was right next to the uh, counting center and the all the stores and everything else. Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to it again. This is just from what you're saying, my interpretation. I think that that really plays off of that whole concept of planning for the people's needs. What are their needs? What could that space be for their needs? So I think um, that just kind of speaks to what uh, Robert Simmons and James Rouse was trying to do was plan for the needs so things could could hopefully strive. Any other questions? Yes. No. Um, so, okay. Again, it's going to be confusing because there's a lot of names. So the Rouse Company mortgage broker, he had a lot of um, a lot of his times he worked with um, the Connecticut Insurance Company. Um, and they were the ones who helped fund Columbia. So how I mentioned that ARM, HRD, Howard Research and Development, they were co-owned by the Connecticut Insurance Company. So uh, uh, Wild Lake uh, was actually named after the man who ran that insurance company, Fraser Wild. Um, so he named that village after him. Does that answer your question? Yeah, just like I off the top of my head, I do not know the numbers, but again, I could always look that up for you. So please reach out. Yes. Okay, I have a question, Megan. Yeah. So I'm um I'm curious to know how 
Greenbelt has struggled to keep itself, and keep, keep the integrity of the original design of the architecture and the general layout, how that has worked out over time. It has been a huge struggle, and the center of town largely. Um, I feel like anyone get my coffee. Look, there, look there in the center of town. Uh, that's been preserved uh, over the years, largely through citizen activism. There was a newspaper that was established in the very early moments of the town's uh, founding. So that newspaper was a great way for people to communicate quickly and relatively quickly uh, and easily about um, sort of um, threats to the um, to the original uh section of town, the historic section of town, if you will. And that belt of green space that was supposed to surround the community to be a buffer against encroaching development and also provide recreational spaces had to be sold off somewhat um, because the, the group of veterans that purchased the original um, land couldn't afford everything. So they've been sort of selling it off bit by bit and that sort of started to um, erode that center of town. But for the most part, whenever there has been a, a serious threat, for instance, the planning commission wanted to bring a, a road right through Greenbelt, um, the citizens, um, you know, they banded together, they formed a committee, that's like the Greenbelt way, and they uh, fought it. They went so far as to actually put up um, stakes and signs in people's yards to show how close, you know, where the road was actually going to go. So they went to like for like a, a physical manifestation of it. And that really helped to sort of change the tide um, and get people to to go against it. So Greenbelt does not have its own zoning authority, which is a big issue. Um, it relies on the Maryland National Capital Park Planning Commission and also some of the county um, zoning. So it's definitely something that is always on the minds, I think, of Greenbelters, particularly the city council and the, the citizens who are the most active is those threats. Um, now, I will say when there's been this infill development, um, city council has often uh, made it a sort of um, prerequisite, if you will, that the newer developments that come in have some element of Greenbelt's original plan. So they insist on walking paths, recreational spaces, and that there be some green space set aside. There's a new development that, um, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been over there, but Beltway Plaza is one of these aging malls that's kind of um, past its heyday and they are looking to redevelop it. And so the plans have gone through several incarnations now with city council sort of saying, okay, we'll accept this, but only if you change this, only if you change that. So they're gonna try to bring in um, adequate green space and some space for arts. Um, and some of the other developments have also done those things. You know, you can see elements of the plan that sort of like percolate here and there. Particularly, there's a huge garden apartment complex that was called Spring Hill Lake. It was the largest garden uh, garden apartment complex on the East Coast when it was built in 64, very contemporary um, with what we're talking about tonight. And that, when you go there, you can still see these walkways and pathways that sort of wind through the community, um, even though it doesn't have, um, it's not as total a vision, but there are elements of it. So really it's down to the citizens fighting against those, those and threats. And what about the integrity of the architecture, you know, maintaining that? Yeah. Clean Absolutely, those clean lines. That is largely up to the um, the cooperative, and they have a book of it's like a citizens hand a, a, a cooperative member handbook, and they go through bit by bit. You know what colors you can paint. There's quite a process for putting an addition on your home. Those are very heavily restricted. And now the county has what they call a conservation overlay zone um, that is going to put further restrictions on what you can do to your home. So the historic fabric of the original structures in Greenbelt is actually pretty good. Um, in places like Green Hills, Ohio, they're tearing their homes down, some of them. They're claiming that they're derelict, but really they wanna put up larger homes that can get a bigger, um, bigger tax, you know, pay more taxes. Um, so, but Green Hills is the one that I believe had the most intact belt of green space still in existence. And yet um, in a way that kept their tax base from progressing um, because of that space that they hadn't sold off. So the fact that Green Belters, you know, sold some of it off is kind of a trade-off because it helped them sort of, um, um, make some money, make some income and increase the tax base there, which then funded the city, et cetera. So, but there are still um, people that want to put up um, aluminum siding on their cinder block homes. And we are against that, uh, not technically because I'm not supposed to have an opinion, um, but when we give tours to historic preservationists, you know, they're very accusatory. They say, how could you let this happen? 
you know, and we don't have any control over at the museum. I can I can show them pictures of what it was originally like and show them the damage that it'll do to their homes, but they still do allow that. The point that a lot of people make is that Rebuild's not in mothballs, you know, it's not Williamsburg, it's where it's an active living community and um, people want to make changes to their homes sometimes. And so they try to, the co-op tries to balance the needs of its members along with the um, the significance, the historic significance. It is a national landmark. Um, so it's an important part of it. Yes, um, in the back, I think was, <laughs> sorry. People with that's a great question. Um, in the early years, many of them worked in the city in DC and they had to have, um, they actually organized to hire a bus to take them to a streetcar line to get there and they carpooled the cooperative way. Um, now, um, and as time has progressed, many of people work in um, at the University of Maryland at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, which is right next door at NASA. Um, there truly are, you know, many, many um, sort of aerospace engineers that live in the community. <laughs> so, uh, and a lot of times with um, families where one person works in Baltimore and one person works in DC, it's a great spot in between those two. Um, so it's really a, a, it's a, it's a mix. So, but I know people that work in, you know, all those places, including somebody that works in Annapolis and a colleague of mine that works at Greenbelt actually lives um, over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and commutes in. So it's really, um, it's not quite as, um, everything's not as clustered so close together now. People are, are traveling further, I think. And most people that live in Greenbelt say the quality of life is pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, the access to green space and yeah. Sure. Yes. That's right, that's right. So there's the cooperative that owns the original housing but then um, they don't have any kind of um, political power, if you will. So then the city council actually oversees all of the community. It's a city council and city manager form of government. So Greenville has grown extensively beyond just this one little historic area. So it's about six square miles, about 3,800 acres. And so there's lots of development that's come along since then. But the Greenbelt City Council does not have its own zoning authority. So that has to, that's at the county level. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> so the yeah. So the so the green the green belt. It's like an area of yes, exactly. It's a section of town. Yeah, it's the exactly exactly. It's called old green belt or historic green belt or original green belt. Um, but there's much more development that's encroached all around it, including the sprawl that the planners warned would happen. It's there. It's all called green belt. The whole thing is Greenbelt, but the, the original, yeah, yeah, mostly historic, historic, historic Greenbelt or old Greenbelt. Yeah, we sort of use both of those interchangeably, but it is, it is quite confusing. <laughs> so, yes. Is it an incorporated city or just a community? It is an incorporated city. Yeah, it got its charter in 1936 in June. Um, so it's, we celebrate Greenbelt Day weekend, which is a strange combination of words but um that's when the the community got its charter so yeah yeah yes well so you mentioned uh the population of Greenbelt, i guess greater Greenbelt. yeah is yeah percent. it's about twenty four thousand. that's correct but the original the original development more like, yeah, it was 888 homes, so it was more like 2,500 to 3,000, I believe. Yeah, so it started off pretty small. Yeah, and then, well, and then, um, and then a thousand more homes were added at wartime, which caused everybody great anxiety because it was going to be such a stress on the city services. Um, they had so many kids at the elementary school that they ran them in shifts, um, so they had to build another school. Yeah, there's a lot from the wartime era that um, that people still. Um, you know, the, a lot of oral histories talk about that as, as a challenging time. So do they, uh, uh, do those, those houses don't exist ever? The, they do actually. And it's it's something that, um, it's, a, it's an interesting point because the homes, when they were built by the federal government, by the land under the auspices of the Lanham Act in 41, 42, the community was told they were gonna be temporary houses just for wartime workers and they'd be torn down like so many, you know, communities, um, so many, I should say, temporary communities in wartime. However, um, they're still there and they are part of the cooperative. Um, they are 
some people think they're not quite as well built as the original homes. They were built more quickly. However, you can do more with the interiors. If you've got a brick or block, you've a brick or block. So in the end, actually, in terms of heating and cooling these spaces, having the um, the um, the they call them frame homes um, is a little bit. You have a little bit of an advantage there. And they were never torn down. Now we have an historian um, who has lived in the community for a long time and actually went to the archives and found a piece of paper that says that they were never intended to be temporary homes. But everyone we've ever talked to, all of the oral histories, even people that are still around today say, we were told they were temporary. So you have to wonder if the federal government was letting them think that to, you know, to sort of reassure that it wasn't gonna be there forever. Um, but he, so we have, we need to kind of tweak our language about that because it's, you know, it's something that is, it's a little gray. And one last thing. Sure. Uh, do they use the the No. <laughs> no, they don't, they don't. There are a lot of rules. I mean, someone in the co-op would probably say they have just as many rules, but but no, they don't have the 4 p.m. curfew at all. Yeah. Can you hang your laundry out of the back? You can, and a lot of people do. A lot of people do. It's, it's yeah, in fact, so there was an entry in the Labor Day Parade, a group, I can't where they had some clever name, but they were trying to bring back this idea of using the service side, you know, to hang your laundry. Um, so I guess it's not that different than a, you know, in a condo associations at the beach sometimes say you can't hang your towels over the, over the balconies, you know, things like that. But there's a very famous oral history where a woman was about to go into labor and um, she was very, very worried because her laundry was on the line. So she had to get one of her court neighbors to go and take the laundry off the line. You know, they really took it seriously which seems kind of insane, but you know, they really, they did. So it's a different era altogether, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Before everybody departs, <laughs> just wanna say thank you again. Thank you to Aaron and Megan for making the trip down here and doing this for us. Um, we did record the program tonight, so we'll get it um, up on our YouTube channel in a bit. And then we do have an exhibit going on over at the museum right now. Erin and Megan helped put it together. Um, and we have some artifacts from our archives as well that talk about Greenbelt and Columbia. So we'll have that up through the end of October. So I hope you all can make it over there and see that. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. And I'll get you guys your, yeah, before, before I take them with me un, unintentionally. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I was laughing. Maybe I didn't save it right. Thank you. Because I am so mad at you. No.